And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his commandments, in him verily is the love of God perfected, and hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he, the Lord Jesus, walked. Those verses from 1 John chapter 2 and verses 3 to 6 introduce our program today, which is entitled <clears throat> The Walk of a True Christian. And I am the host of the program, Paul Fry, just delighted for this privilege to speak with you about what we know is true, and we warmly greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that name which is above every name, that name that one day every knee shall bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> The Bible speaks of two kingdoms in this world, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God's dear Son, as we read in Colossians 1.13. If we can say we're in the kingdom of God's dear Son, which can only be by the new birth, which the Lord Jesus spoke about in John chapter 3 and verses 3 to 8, where we've been made spiritually alive in Jesus Christ, that's the only way we can get into the kingdom of God. We must be born of water and of the Spirit, or we can never enter the kingdom of God, the water being the Word of God, and the Spirit that applies the Word of God to our hearts and makes us alive in Jesus Christ. Well, if that has been true in our lives, then there should be some evidence in the life that now is. And so I would like to read our text from Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 17. And this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, <clears throat> through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, which is on, sensu on bridled sensuality, to work all uncleanness with greediness. <clears throat> but ye have not so learned Christ. If so, be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former manner of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to its deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither let give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his own hands that he may give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. The first words we'd like to talk about is a separated walk from this world system, from its fashions and from its standards, as we've read in verses 17 to 19. That's why in Galatians 1, 4, we read that the Lord Jesus suffered for our sins, that he might deliver us from this evil world, not to take us out of the world, but no longer being of the world, in the world, but not of the world. I'd like to speak about the vanity. He says we're not to walk in the vanity of our minds anymore. What does that mean? It simply means emptiness, useless, worthless. Let me illustrate it by speaking about Solomon. He said, I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, which is social merriment, <coughs> and therefore enjoy pleasure. And what he said? Behold, 
all is vanity. And it would do you good to read Ecclesiastes 2, verses 1 to 11, because King Solomon, he had all kind of money. He said, I'm going to experiment. I'm going to, uh, uh, anything that my heart desires, my flesh desires, I'm going to experiment with it. And after he was done experimenting, you know what he said? Vanity of vanities, it's all vanity. It's all useless, worthless. Yes, <clears throat> well, to show you, uh, that's what men live for today. But that's not what we're to live for. We're to live for that other world, the world in which righteousness and holiness reigns, the home of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're to live for and to work for. It says... <clears throat> Um, and in that text, it says we're to uh, be free from a darkened understanding. I remember when in the business world, I was, uh, I was witnessing to a customer. And this customer, when he went out the door, says, I'm going to hell and I'm going to be glad of it. And I ran after him to try to help to reason. But when a person is dead in trespasses and sins, they're absolutely blind and dead to spiritual life and the things pertaining to God, our Creator and Redeemer. <clears throat> yes, there was a time in John 3.19, yes, there was a time where it says in John 3.19 uh, that this is a condemnation. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In other words, they didn't want the light. That was me at one time. Romans 8, 7. The natural man is hostile to God because he's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 10, 3. He's ignorant to the righteousness of God. But now Ephesians 5, 8. Yeah, we were sometimes darkness, but now we're light in the Lord and we're to walk as children of light. And then we're no longer <coughs> alienated from the life of God. It, yes, at one time I was religious, but not right with God. Yes, I honored the Lord with my lips, but my heart was far from me. Like it says in Matthew 15, 8 and 9. Titus 1, 16. Yes, the people in Crete and Cyprus, they professed that they knew God, but in works they denied him, and every work reprobate, useless. But now... When Christ changes the heart, when he comes to take residence in the sanctuary of our soul. Now it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Praise his name. Colossians 3, 1 to 4, it says that if you then be made alive in Christ, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, for you're dead to them now. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Then when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we shall appear with him in glory. Yes, at one time we're spiritually blind, blinded by the God of this age. If, you're, if the gospel is hid, it's, it's because the God of this age has blinded our hearts, so we believe not. Yes, we're governed by our feelings. That's the way we live the life, governed by our feelings. But now a change has taken place. And we prepare for that divine appointment, like it says in Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this then, the judgment. In 2 Corinthians 5, 9, labor to be accepted of the Lord, for you have a divine appointment where we'll stand before him when he's our judge and give an account of the things which we have done, whether they're good or whether they're bad. And then the word uh, lasciviousness, unsens unbridled sensuality, it can come into the church. Paul was in prison. He wrote to the church of Philippi, and he said, Mark those who walk, even as you have us, for example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. For their God is their belly, their glory is their shame, who mind earthly things, and whose end is their destruction. Yes, at one time, the old man governed our lives. Listen to these words from Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. And you have the quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, who in times past walked according to the course of this world, his standards and fashions, and, <clears throat> and according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among all, we all had our matter of life in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But now, but now, yes, at one time, <clears throat> we were carnally minded, and we were under spiritual death. But now to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
Yes, at one time, the old man governed our life, but now we got rid of those dirty grave clothes. The clothing of the past life is now changed for the spiritual clothing of the Redeemer. In Luke 16, it speaks about the rich man who feasted every day sumptuously. And then the poor man, Lazarus, he was a beggar. And sores covered his body, and the dogs licked his sores. Which would you rather have been? The rich man with uh, all he, uh, his heart could desire, or the poor man? Well, you might say, I would like to be like the rich man in time. But in eternity, the roles reversed. The poor beggar who had believed in the Lord Jesus, he was raised up in the royal fashion of a child of the Most High, a child of the King. And the other man, the rich man, now he's lingering, lingering in the darkness of hell, in the dungeon of hell. He had no time for God in, in life. Now he'll have all kind of time <clears throat> apart from God in hell. Yes, dear ones, the scriptures tell us how the Christian should live. And that is a devoted walk with Christ. We were to be renewed in the spirit of our mind <clears throat> that, we put off the, uh, uh, that we put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness and the image of God is restored. Now, we want to talk about that <coughs> devoted walk with Christ in uh, verses 20 to 32. In the days when Jesus Christ walked upon the earth, men followed by sight. But Jesus said in the upper room in John 14, 16, he said, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to send another comforter, the blessed Holy Spirit. And so now you will not be walking by sight, but now you'll be walking by faith, just like Enoch and uh, Noah of old walked by faith, and all the Old Testament saints, they walked by faith. <clears throat> Notice it says in verse 20, we're to learn of him. It's not only, it's a continuous learning of him. You see, the four gospel accounts reveal his humanity and his deity, and two good examples of what it means to continuous learning of him is one by Mary of Bethany, um, yes, as she, uh, uh, her home, the Lord had visited often because she, uh, he was a welcome guest there, but she loved to sit at his feet and listen to his teaching and to his preaching. Mary, uh, the sister Martha got irritated at that, and she said, let Mary come and help me. And Jesus said, she has chosen the good part, and it will not be taken from her. In other words, the Lord commended her because she wanted to learn about him. And then the apostle Paul and it, after the, he was met on the road to Damascus by the Lord, his life was completely changed. And listen to what he said. What I counted gain, now I count a loss. Yea, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but the righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That all changed, and that's the way we're to walk. We're to walk by faith. Four times in the scripture says, the righteous shall walk by faith. Christ commands us to learn of him and be taught by him. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, that great invitation when he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then he says this, take my yoke upon you. Come under my authority. That's the only way we can learn about him. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Apostle Peter exhorts us to grow in his knowledge. <clears throat> Just think of all we can learn of his deity in his creative work, all we can learn of his deity and <clears throat> his humanity and his redemptive work. And so Apostle Peter, he too was going to be martyred. He knew that. He said, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. And the only way to walk with Christ is to agree with him. Like it says in Amos 3.3, 3, we're to walk with him and agree with him, even those words that are hard to accept. Like it says in uh, Luke 14 and 33, that no man can be my disciple unless he forsakes all and follows me. We don't like to hear that. But he means to make us understand that when he saves us, he owns us. He becomes our Lord and a master, and he will lead us in pleasant paths. Yes, besides still waters, in green pastures, he'll lead us. 
And the only way to walk with Christ is to remember that he's the light of the world. As he said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that walked, followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And John 12, 26, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be also. And then he speaks about the, the adversary in verse 27. Satan is the mutual adversary of you and the mutual adversary of Christ. His serpentine kingdom from the very beginning was in conflict with Christ and those in his kingdom. As we read in Genesis 3.15, God speaking to the serpent and dwelt by Satan, I put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. Oh yes, you'll bruise his heel, but he shall crush your head. And that conflict has been going on from that time forth. And every time we resort to the flesh, we open the door for Satan to come in. We're to recognize that we're to be steadfast to the truth. It says in verse <clears throat> uh, uh, 27, it's uh, 25, be steadfast and true. Lie not to your neighbor, because remember one of another. And dear one, every lie, whether it's exaggerated lie, whether it's a lie that diminishes lie, we exaggerate or we diminish as it affects our person. Every white lie, every gray lie, even the blackest of lies, they all are imitation of Satan who was a liar from the beginning who is called the father of lies in John 8, 44. We're to be steadfast in the truth, to love the truth and let the truth control us because Jesus is the truth. Then it speaks in verse 26 about anger. You know, we get angry not over that which is dishonors God, but we get anger over that which injures us. We get angry over every insult. But wasn't that way with our Lord Jesus when he walked upon the earth? It says when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But he trusted him who judgeth righteously, and that's what we're to do. The, never, the Lord never angered what was done against him, but only what dissundered the Father and the temple where the, res, the visible presence of God dwelt. He said, this is my father's house, but you made it a den of thieves, and he drove them all out. That was his only purpose for anger. And in verse 32, it speaks about an unforgiving spirit. An unforgiving spirit gives place to the devil, opens the door for Satan. And why so many Christians find it difficult to forgive, I don't know. But we were forgiven for Christ's sake, for God's sake. <clears throat> God forgave us for Christ's sake, as it says in verse 32. Then in verse 29 and 28, it speaks about stealing. There are many ways to steal. We can steal regarding time. <clears throat> we can steal regarding doing a business deal. There are so many ways, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but every time we exercise any kind of dishonesty, we are stealing, and we're to labor with our hands to provide for him that needeth. You see, this laboring for one that needeth is to imitate God because he provides for our needs every day. He gives us life and breath every day. He gives us the rain that falls upon the just and the unjust. He gives us the sunshine that, falls, that shines upon the evil and the good. We are to be imitators of him. Acts 14, 17, it's, it says about this. It says, the Lord left himself not without witness, but that he did good. He sent rain from heaven. Why? To bring forth fruit from the ground. Why? To make the heart of man glad. And then, as we said before, he gives us life and breath each day. And then <clears throat> in verse 29, it speaks about uh, our language. Let me read it exactly as it is recorded. 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Let me share this with you. Sometimes the... The language of those who profess to know Christ sounds like the language of the world. We even lower ourselves to use the same four-lettered words that the world uses. Colossians 4, 6 tells us this, that your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. In other words, our language is not to tear down, but to build up. 
but it seems it's more easy to tear down than to build up. It seems one of the great sins of, of believers is gossip, gossip, gossip. We love to take the juicy tales and share it with, whether they're true or not. It's gossip. And then we're to love God with all our heart. You know, it says we're grieve not the Holy Spirit by which we're sealed until the day of redemption. I can only tell you, you know when you grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is to occupy the throne room and the sanctuary of our heart. And every time we grieve him, we push him aside. And every one of us knows when we grieve him, and when I grieve him, I love to get my knees and ask for forgiveness. Just think of all we have in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit makes the Lord Jesus so real to the heart, as it talks about in John 16, 13 to 15. And I could only just encourage you to walk, at the walk of a true Christian is to be under the sovereignty, under the yoke of the Lord Jesus, and in submission to the, to the God in us, the hope of glory, the Holy Spirit, who dwells in us, guides us, directs us, convicts us. Let him be our master. Just a few words in application. Men were first called Christians in Antioch. Why were they called Christians? They weren't called Christians by, um, on, by believers. No, they were called Christians by unbelievers. And what these unbelievers saw, they saw in their life, in their walk, and the walk is a way of life. They saw it imitating and reflecting Jesus Christ, whom they professed. Let me ask you, does your walk, does your life reflect Jesus Christ? When you go to the grocery store, when you stand in line, when people are impolite, when <clears throat> people insult you, do you imitate Jesus Christ then? You see, that's what's lacking in the church today, and that's why we've lost our influence. You see, the church, the people of Antioch was like New York City. Wisdom, world, and wickedness. But these believers, these were Gentiles that had been converted by the gospel, the people and the persecution, everywhere they went preaching the gospel, some of them settled in Antioch, and they really not only preached the gospel, but they lived the gospel. And that's why they saw such an imitation of the person of Jesus Christ that they talked about that they called them Christians. And I believe <clears throat> that's the reason why Christianity is losing its influence in the world today, because many profess Christ, but they live the way of the world. Let me ask you a question. What is our eternal security if we're Christians in name only? Do you think the Lord does not see uh, the hypocrisy that dwells with Do you think he does not see when we profess him with our mouth and our heart is far, far from him, when we ape the world instead of Jesus Christ? Don't you think he sees that? What? You, look what Jesus said. You talk about security. Can you feel confidence with this? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And that's the title of our message. The walk of a true Christian follows Jesus Christ. They're led by him, directed by his spirit, and they live to glorify him. And listen to what the rest of that verse says. They follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. That's eternal security. And then another thing. Christ has done for sinners, and then for them only to give him lip service <clears throat> that can only come from a regenerated heart. How sad that is. How sad that is. I guess my own heart grieves not only at my own failures at times not to imitate Christ, but as I see it in Christendom all around. When you get to be 86, you get to observe a lot. And that's the reason my soul is exercised about preaching the, the, the walk of a true Christian. 
We can sum up all that we have said tonight, this, uh, today. We can sum up all we said in two verses that if obeyed will exemplify the walk of a true Christian. In Romans 12, Paul writing to, the, uh, he wrote the book of Romans. He began with condemnation. Then he speaks about the blessing of justification. He speaks about sanctification, glorification, and then election. And the next words he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your holy, uh, uh, reasonable service of worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed <clears throat> by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable will of God. And the mark of a true Christian is that he wants to be in the will of God because his master came down from heaven not to do his own will, but the will of him that sent him. In closing, I want to show you this book called, Is It Real? And I've inferred that much of Christianity today is not real. But this was written by John MacArthur, a man too in his 80s, who has a, a large-sized church in California. But he's been concerned about members in his own congregation. <clears throat> they profess Christ, but their lives do not imitate Christ. And so he wrote this book, and it's about 11 biblical tests of genuine salvation. And all I can say is, I want to make it available to all of you without charge. All you have to do is call the number, which is in the <clears throat> uh, bottom of your screen. And I just love to give out what I know is true. And please call. We have 50 other different booklets, 50 uh, um, <clears throat> uh, tracks, gospel tracks. They're all free. Until we meet again, God bless you, and may you be looking on to the one who loves you, the author and finisher of your faith, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.